Oh, hi there. There are some pretty wild pieces of lost media, but sometimes I come across something that just makes me go, Boy, that escalated quickly. I mean, that really got out of hand fast. This can either be lost media that itself turns out to be unexpectedly disturbing, or lost media that features individuals who, in hindsight, cast a dark shadow on the entire production, making the viewer see everything in a different light. Today, we are covering unexpectedly dark lost media. And because of the nature of this video and YouTube's ever-expanding list of content rules, I will be playing Try Not To Say The Wrong Words and Get This Video Demonetized, Level Impossible. So to keep things running at All Things Lost, this video is sponsored by Factor. Factor makes meeting your nutrition goals easier than ever by delivering fresh, never frozen, dietitian approved meals right to your doorstep. With Factor, you can skip the trip to the grocery store, skip the chopping, the prepping, and the cleaning too, while still having fresh meals that are ready in just two minutes. All you have to do is heat and enjoy. There are even keto, calorie smart, vegan, veggie, and protein plus options on the menu each week. It's like a grown up version of those TV dinners you had as a kid, only with actual nutritional value and without the sound of your parents getting divorced in the background. With 34 chef-prepared, dietitian-approved weekly options, there's always something new to try. With an assortment of 36-plus sweets, smoothies, juices, and more satisfying add-ons, you can easily adjust your order size or even skip a week. Factor sent me a few of their meals, and they are fire. For real, if you're looking for a cheap, fast, easy, and delicious meal, you cannot go wrong with Factor. They sent me some of their smoothies too, which are incredible. To get America's number one ready-to-eat meals, head to Factor75.com or click the link below and use the code ATL50 to get 50% off your first Factor box. Again, that's ATL50 to get 50% off. Bullseye Bullseye was a British dart quiz show hybrid, airing from 1981 to 1995 on ITV. The show had three teams of two working together to win cash and prizes by answering questions and playing darts. Now, in a video about lost media that takes a dark turn, you might assume that the culprit is one of those pointy objects being tossed around by nervous contestants. But the show seemed pretty safe in that regard. No, the disturbing twist comes from the dark past of a contestant, something that might show up again in this video. On May 28th, 1989, an episode aired featuring John Cooper, who turned out to be a wanted criminal. Four years prior to his appearance on Bullseye, Cooper took the lives of siblings Helen and Richard Thomas, burnt down their home, and fled the scene. During his time on Bullseye, he gave no indication of what he was capable of. He just talked about his love of scuba diving, describing his time on the Welsh coast. He and his partner didn't end up winning anything, and the loss must have really got to him because just a month after his appearance on Bullseye, Cooper would attack again. On June 29th, 1989, Peter and Gwenda Dixon, not siblings, were on a camping trip when they were ambushed by Cooper. The police found their bodies but had no leads, but there was one witness who was able to give the police a hazy description of a suspicious man who may have been the killer. Cooper would continue into the 90s until he was picked up in 1998 and charged with 30 counts of robbery, sentenced to 14 years in prison. Prosecutors were suspicious that he had committed far more than just burglary, but authorities had no evidence and he was released in 2009. But luckily, his freedom was short-lived. During a review of cold cases, they finally had the evidence they needed to put him away for good. Through advances in forensic technology, they were able to link Cooper's DNA to the crime scene of Peter and Helen Dixon. And his appearance on Bullseye in the late 80s was the final nail in his coffin. If you remember, in the episode, Cooper talked about scuba diving, where he described the Welsh coast. The location he described is where they found the bodies of Peter and Gwenda Dixon. Additionally, his appearance on the show was an exact match of the police sketch the police gathered all those years ago. He was sentenced to life in prison and is believed to have committed even more heinous acts that he has yet to confess to. Since John Cooper's conviction, the episode of Bullseye has not re-aired. Only a few fragments of it survive today, but because the footage was used to convict Cooper, authorities may still be in possession of a copy. It was Metallica, Us, and Lost Profits. That dude. <laughs> yeah, he's a mess. There's he's a piece not of enough pain in the world for that. Yeah. The Lost Prophets' fourth album and their Lost music video. The Lost Prophets were a Welsh rock band. They initially got attention through their song Last Train Home and reached mainstream success with their track Rooftops off the 2006 album Liberation Transmission. And the band has two notable pieces of lost media. 
Their initial attempts to follow up Liberation Transmission failed. They ended up scrapping an entire album's worth of music that they had already spent half a million dollars making. They would eventually release a follow-up in 2010, their fourth studio album, The Betrayed. It was met with decent reviews. The album retained a few songs from the scrapped sessions, and a few of the scrapped songs were later reused for other albums. But four songs meant for this scrapped album have never been found. Credible vs. Incredible, The Morning Rain, What Seems to Be the Problem Officer, and She's with the Band. And I'm gonna be upfront with you, I don't think these will ever be found. They've probably been thrown away because no one wants to be associated with this band anymore. Because everything they have ever done has a massive black cloud hanging over it. That's all because Lost Prophets lead singer Ian Watkins is pretty decisively the worst person in music history. And I'm really not exaggerating either. In my video on recently found Lost Media, I said R. Kelly was just about the worst person in all of music. And I worded that very carefully because it's generally accepted that Ian Watkins is the single worst person in all of music. If I described what he did, this video would be not only demonetized, but Google would kick down my door personally and make me Lost Media. If you don't believe me, a detective on the case, Peter Doyle, said, In my view, that potentially makes him the most dangerous offender I have ever seen. Where their lost album and the four songs that are still lost aren't a direct result of Ian's crimes, the next piece is. On December 3rd, 2012, Ian Watkins tweeted that he was on his way to shoot a music video for the upcoming single, Some Days. It can be assumed that filming was completed, but we have seen nothing from the video and will probably never see the final product because two weeks later, Ian was arrested, resulting in the breakup of Lost Profits. To make things even worse, he has expressed little remorse for his crimes and is eligible for release as early as 2036. Hopefully that will not happen. It's four o'clock in the morning. Why on earth are you making chocolate pudding? Because I've lost control of my life. Rugrats, Incredible Storyboard Jam. A storyboard jam is basically a comic that's passed around between animators on the crew of a cartoon. Everyone makes their own additions to it without a planned plot or setup. Most of the time, these storyboard jams lead to lewd depictions of beloved characters, but are generally made in good fun to help animators blow off steam and express frustration, typically when working on a kid's show. But one storyboard jam has become infamous for taking things way too far. Around 1998, the production crew behind the Rugrats started a storyboard jam called Incredible. According to a now-deleted live journal post by Rugrats animator and director Steve Russell, Angelica is being a bitch to Tommy, so Tommy gets her a drink in the kitchen and puts in dog food and Drano, then toddles back to Angelica. Russell said he was reluctant to contribute to the storyboard, but eventually added 12 frames. In this live journal post, he leaks the third page of the story jam, and this is where things get really out of hand. In the page, Stu comes home and starts hitting everyone, and makes uncomfortable remarks to Angelica, while Tommy twitches uncontrollably. According to Steve Russell, the next page had a close-up of Stu's junk with the text, Balls of Thunder. From there, the comic made its way to other artists and got even more graphic. According to Russell, I was disgusted even, when I saw what had become of the comic. Some artists went on to show the animators of the Wild Thornberries, but on their way, an executive producer on the show saw the storyboard and immediately confiscated it. We can assume that the Rugrats storyboard jam, Incredible, was immediately thrown in the trash. Only the third page that was leaked by Russell remains. And then, the Mythbusters put their money where their mouths are as they sniff out what's got more nutrients, breakfast cereal, or the box it comes in. Mythbusters, Cannibal Mouse. Mythbusters is generally a pretty wholesome and educational show. Each week, its hosts, Jamie and Adam, test various myths and urban legends, putting them up to scientific scrutiny. Over the course of the show, it debunked some really unexpected things and succeeded in giving both a grounded view of our world while still making the experiments a spectacle. But one myth, while interesting, was tested through some questionable methods. This incident comes from the Mythbusters' only unaired and effectively lost segment that has become lovingly dubbed Cannibal Mouse. One of the myths tested on the 2006 episode Steam Cannon was, a cereal box can have more nutritional value than the cereal. While this segment did make it to air, and many of you have probably seen it before, it's kind of strange. Like I said before, the Mythbusters have a way of making every myth they test a spectacle, or at least engaging to watch. But this one was phoned in. They described the nutritional value of cardboard and test it in some really uninteresting ways, compared to their usual highly coordinated and entertaining approach to science. 
Years later, Adam would explain the reason for this. During the initial test of the myth, things took a dark and unexpected turn. They placed lab mice into three groups, those fed with normal mouse food, others fed with sugary cereal, and finally, a group of mice that were only fed cardboard box pellets. The mice that were fed cardboard began acting strange over the next few days. They noted their behavior and continued with the experiment. They left for the night, and when they returned the following morning, they found that the mice fed normal food and the mice fed sugary cereal were both just as they left them. But in the test group, they was only fed cardboard. A single mouse remained. He had eaten all the other mice in the group. In Adam's own words, They looked like the fat mouse had eaten them like corn on the cob. They were a head and a tail and nothing but a rib cage in between. In the unaired segment, Jamie and Adam tried to play it off as grotesquely funny, holding up the cannibal mouse they called Killer. But it was not a good look for the show, and the Discovery Channel refused to air the segment. Adam has admitted to making a rough cut of the segment and showing it to a university in Michigan, but when Discovery found out, they told him to never show it again. The Mythbusters have made a point to not test on animals. The only other time I remember them testing on an animal was for radiation testing on cockroaches. And even then it was met with controversy. Needless to say, this would be an interesting, albeit dark, piece of lost media to uncover. Hello there, Father. Uh, hello, Colm. <laughs> I hear you're a racist now, Father. Who <laughs> said I'm a racist? Everyone's saying it, Father. Should we all be racist now? What's the official line the church is taking on this? Father Ted, alternate ending. Father Ted was a sitcom airing on Channel 4 in Britain from 1995 to 1998. Starring Dermot Morgan, it follows the character Father Ted, a priest dishonorably exiled to a clergy house on a remote island near Ireland. The show had some controversial episodes and was not afraid to push the boundaries of sitcom TV. And in the last episode of the series, called Going to America, they intended to subvert expectations with a surprisingly dark ending. In the series finale that made it to air, Father Ted saves Father Kevin from jumping off a building. This redeems Father Ted, and he's invited to end his exile and live in a parish in LA. He boards a plane, but ends up coming back to stay on the island permanently. The show ends with a touching montage. A fairly cookie cutter ending, but based on the original script, which is confirmed to have been filmed, things didn't end so upbeat. It started with a similar setup. Father Ted saves Father Kevin from jumping off a building. Ted is invited to LA, but the plans fall apart and he can't leave the island. Being robbed of his choice to leave, Ted becomes depressed, feeling that he will never escape. He once again sees Father Kevin ready to jump out a window with onlookers gathered around in shock. But this time, Ted joins him. The original script reads, we see a banner that reads, it's still great being a priest. Below it, a group of priests are standing, facing a window. There is much worry and concern on their face. Cut to outside, where we see Kevin standing on a ledge, occasionally glancing down. From his point of view, we see the cars far down below. The group of priests parts, and Ted comes through them. He then goes to the window and climbs out. He ushers Kevin along the ledge. Ted says, move up a bit. The end. Imagine a sitcom ending like this. The show is known for some darker themes, but man. <laughs> as intriguing as this conclusion is, the public has never seen it. And that's because two days after filming Wrapped, Father Ted actor Dermot Morgan passed away of a heart attack at age 45. The show's writers had their reservations about the original ending, so an alternate ending was already prepared. And out of respect for Dermot Morgan and his family, they decided to use the happy ending for the series finale. The script for this darker season finale has long been released, but none of the footage of the unseen alternate ending has currently been found. The Dillinger Escape Plan Concert Now, this one's about poop, so it's kind of more gross than dark, but there definitely is a disturbing aspect to it. And I mean, I think we've all had, I think we've all had some dark poops. Everyone can relate to that. Anyways, New Jersey math core band, the Dillinger Escape Plan, were playing a set at the 2002 Reading Festival in England. They say to themselves, you know what, let's bring some of that New Jersey charm across the pond. The band is known for some crazy over-the-top performances, but what they did at the 2002 Reading Festival is considered one of the most shocking in rock history. They made national headlines when during their set, frontman Greg Pucciato dropped his shorts, puckered up the old chocolate starfish in full view of the crowd, and took a dump in a paper bag, which he of course threw into the audience, before smearing the rest on himself. 
after which he seemingly compared the bag of poop to the other performers at the festival, particularly Puddle of Mud and Hooba Stink. And for the Brits, poopy on stage was a touch too far. The Dillinger escape plan were banned from the festival and nearly banned from the entire UK, though their performance is still regarded as one of the best in the festival's history. It's believed that the incident was broadcast on British TV, but only two videos of their infamous set had made their way online, none of which includes the bowel movement smelt across the world. There's also believed to be an audio recording of the incident where you could hear Greg Pucciato gagging as he sang, but this remains to be confirmed. The Lost 2012 London Olympics Commercial in 1997, at London's Royal Academy of Art, artist Marcus Harvey unveiled a controversial painting titled Mira 1995, a portrait of infamous serial killer Mira Hindley, known in the UK for her and her boyfriend's crimes against children in the 60s. The portrait was painted with the handprints of children. The entire exhibit was meant to display controversial works, but even in the mix, the portrait of Mira Hindley stood out, sparking protests and was even vandalized multiple times. Eventually, the exhibit concluded and the controversy died down. Until 2008, when it would again make an appearance, but this time, in a most unusual setting. Following the 2008 Olympic Games in Beijing, at the ceremonial handover of the Olympics to London, the tourist organization Visit London screened a promotional video showing off the best parts of London culture. But in the mix, for some reason, is a fleeting glimpse of Marcus Harvey's infamous painting. The clip was met with immediate backlash. After the party, a spokesperson for the event said, The use of this image is in extremely poor taste and should not have been used to promote London. In response, Visit London said, the video is not for general public use and has been used many times over the last few years to show the tourism trade. However, if any offense has been caused, we will withdraw it from use with immediate effect. But it appears this statement isn't entirely correct, as Visit London would later clarify that the video was on their website for some time, meaning that it was released to the public before the controversy. Currently, the only clip we have of this commercial is when it was shown in the background on China Central Television, where the portrait can be seen for a brief second. Since the commercial was available on the Visit London website, there may be a way to retrieve it, but as of the making of this video, we are yet to find the commercial. Michael Fendwick on Wheel of Fortune In the great lost media tradition of game show contestants hiding a dark past, the most infamous might just be Michael Fenwick's appearance on Wheel of Fortune. Filmed on February 13th, 1998 and airing in March, it appeared to be a normal episode. Wheels were spun, fortunes were made, but just two days after its airing, winner of $4,400, Michael Fenwick, was arrested for crimes against children when one of his victims saw his appearance on TV. He would eventually plead guilty, but only ended up serving six years and was released in 2004. It's believed that Fenwick contributed to Wheel of Fortune no longer having returning contestants, though this is still unconfirmed. And unlike other entries in this video, the episode was found on October 2nd, 2020 on the Buy a Vowel board forums by user WheelFan82. Thank you so much for watching. This video was decided on by my Patreon supporters. If you want to help me choose videos, get early access to videos and more, consider supporting me on Patreon. This is Mike with All Things Lost. See you soon.